right, so here we go. Amongst other things, I've got out some of my old slides. This is a 46-year-old image from Lake St. Lucia, and on we go. Okay, so new people um, who I've not met before, very brief introduction to myself. There I am in, in current day above the Sani Pass. My history goes a long way back in birding, 1965. And then from those young early days, from those young early days, I trained as a research ornithologist and I spent some time then three years at Lake St. Lucia, which uh, was a magic time. It may not look like it, looking at these old photographs of me looking for the water. And then basically I ended up working in conservation after being a uh, research ornithologist and now I am uh, running these online courses but this time in St. Lucia too gave me a deep emotional connection to wetlands and so I'm going to take you through a number of the common African birds and I'm going to use each one to tell a story or to tell a different aspect of water birds or water bird ecology um, to try <clears throat> and give you a link through each bird to something, something of difference in each case. So we begin with a truly distinctive iconic African bird, the, the hummercorp. It stands alone. It's the only species in its family. And uh, it is, it's closely related, well, it's most closely related to the pelicans and the, and the fabulous shoebill. So it's a standalone. And the remarkable thing of it, I do believe it enters legend in, uh, in, in many African cultures, but it builds this nest, uh, and I call it a burrow in the sky because they build up this huge nest of sticks and twigs, and then they burrow into it. So it is literally the equivalent of building a burrow in the sky. That's an absolutely remarkable thing. And I've just brought up this picture of a couple of hummercorps mating. It is a very brief encounter in birds, very brief. If you're not watching closely, it comes and goes and... Uh, there's nothing prolonged about it, nothing like what the lions get up to. So here we go. Now, one of the most widespread birds in Africa, the Egyptian goose. The picture at the bottom left taken in my own garden called the Egyptian goose because the ancient Egyptians uh, uh, revered the bird. It has now become a feral breeding bird in Europe and in North America. So I remember last time in the UK seeing the bird there. Uh, it is also of the uh, of the ducks, perhaps the one most likely in Africa to become somewhat urbanized. And they will breed in buildings. And um, uh, because they are ledge breeders at times, you know, buildings constitute a kind of an artificial ledge and they become very tolerant of human beings and they're amongst the few birds which actually basically are grazers as as in the large mammals yeah they go for highly nutrient rich grazing when they have the chance um, and um, you know other really high nutrient uh, foods but geese grazing on the grass now one thing that many people are not aware of is that ducks and geese, when they molt their flight feathers, so quick step back, all birds basically molt all their feathers once a year. Some with breeding plumage, it'll be twice a year. But the way in which the ducks and geese molt their flight feathers is all at once. And so they will find a nice big dam They'll arrive all pink and porky, uh, and, uh, and then for 30 or 40 days, they are unable to fly, and they will lose quite a lot of weight in that time. 
So if they do, if they are not, um, if they haven't laid down enough uh, fat, they, they'll be in trouble at this time. So they are vulnerable, which is, but the ducks have, have evolved this strategy of growing all their flight feathers in one shot. All right, so on we go to African jacanas. Now, they are polyandrous and reverse sex roles. What am I talking about? So the majority of birds, both male and female, play their role. In some birds, uh, a good number of bird species, a male may have several mates, several females. You know, classic are the weavers and the bishop birds and so on. Much, much rarer is when one female will have several males as a mate. So the female is actually a good deal bigger than the male. She's up to two-thirds larger than he is. So if we look at this middle picture, the bird on the, on the right there is likely to be the female, the bigger, chunkier one. And in fact, along with that, if you see a jacana walking around the edge of the pond, that's likely to be a female. And the little one bouncing along the middle, that's the male. So the males will set up territories, and then the female will mate with one after the other. So she never has several, uh, so she's what it's called sequential polyandry, one at a time, and she can lay up to 10 clutches in a season. So it's absolutely remarkable. And then check out, check out this picture. And how remarkable is this? So you see the arrows pointing out the little feet sticking out? So this is a male bird. This is a male bird looking after the chicks. And there he's carrying them underneath his wings. And uh, keep, a, keep a look at the, keep a close watch then on the African jacanas next time you see them. And be aware of this, this, this wonderful backstory to it all. And see if you can pick up things like the males carrying around the youngsters and the you know the way life has evolved with all its various patterns never ceases to amaze. Now here we go. I've taken here the white egrets as a lesson in proportion. So we begin on the left there. So I'm going to do three white egrets, common white egrets across Africa, and on the left there. A little egret. Now check out, you see the yellow feet. I'm going to come back to the yellow feet in a moment with <clears throat> another egret. But what we're going to do now is a lesson in learning proportions of different bird species. I'm going to come back to issues of just general impression, shape and size, and how to identify birds. But I want you to focus on, please, a long, slender, Black bill, black legs. All right. So the next one up is a yellow bill egret. Now it's somewhat larger, and I've got this arrow to show you. Do you see the corner of the mouth there? It's called the gape. It is stops right underneath the eye, and I've accentuated that with this black arrow. Ignore this cattle egret at the back. It's noise. And then the legs, not really showing the true color, but it's sort of palish on the upper leg and dark on the lower leg. Now, I want you to look very carefully at the length of the bill and the length of the neck, because the next one up is a great white egret. And now you can see, you see where the corner of the mouth comes way back behind the eye. And now you see the length of the head there, that distance compared to that, in a great white egret, which is altogether a much bigger bird, but still the bill is relatively a lot longer, as is the head. And you may think, okay, close up, it's easy to see these things. But when these birds are the other side of a lake, how easy is it to make them out? So here we go. Now I'm going to pose a question 
which of course you're going to answer for yourself. And here we go. I came across way back early on this picture showing no fewer than three species of egrets in one picture. Absolutely marvelous. Ignore this one here on the left because it's eating a fish, which throws a complete wobble and confusion into everything. So we're going to look at these five birds here. Well, in fact, don't forget that one. Now, the very first one I'm going to point to is this. <clears throat> now, in your own mind, which of those three egrets is it? Compare, you can see how very long that bill is compared to the head, compared to this one. It has a black bill, right? These two other very large ones have got a yellow bill, but you see these feathers here? These are breeding plumage feathers, which means this bird is in, its bill is in breeding color, so it's black. And by now, I'm probably, hopefully, telling you something you know. This is a great egret. You can see it on the basis of absolute size and relative length of beak and relative length of bill. Therefore, this one has to be the other egret with a yellow bill, the aquatic egret, and it's got to be then a yellow billed egret. And you can see here. That, oops, sorry, let me go back. You can see that that gape does not go back underneath the eye. And then in the foreground here in front of us is a little egret, smaller in size, a good name for it, and a straight, narrow, black bill. So egrets. Now, this is a common gray heron. Now, thinking about herons and egrets, and how they make a living. Because we're going to think about, in the course of this presentation, wetland habitats in a few ways. And you can see what the long legs and long bill of a heron does is it makes, it allows the heron herons to actually walk out. They can occupy a much greater area of habitat than if they had short legs. And the bill allows them, you know, to strike, st uh, strike deeper into the water, etc. So as a strategy, the herons and egrets, long legs and long bills. And this, of course, is, uh, is very obvious when you think about it. But you need to start thinking about with each of these birds and looking at them carefully and say, look at that bill. It must be eating this kind of food or that kind of food. And with the gray heron, by the way, there's a very similar bird and a, a terrestrial bird called the black-headed heron, black-necked heron, which apart from in the adult having black down the back of the neck, this area is always black in the black-headed heron. The underwings of a gray heron are always gray. That's easy to remember. Gray, gray heron, easy peasy. Black-headed heron is black and white. So it has white flight feathers and, um, no, sorry, other, uh, other way around. Black flight feathers and white underwing. Now, rarer amongst and not nearly so often seen, there are a number of small heron species. And I'm just putting this one in. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you now, look at that bill. It is a little bitten. And look at a bill like that. And, you know, given the size of the bird, that's actually a fairly impressive bill. And I just have to show you this picture now. This is the most amazing picture. And it shows you the binocular vision that, that many of the herons and egrets have. Now, having a huge overlap like that on the field of vision of each eye enables predators to actually measure the distance to prey quite accurately. I mean, uh, if there was such a thing, imagine you're a little fish in the water looking up there, and here is this, 
this juvenile little bitten looking at you and you know that you're about to become uh, toast, as it were. Right, now Black Egret. This is, this is truly one of my most favorite birds. It's been a long time actually that I've that I've seen one. It's been a few years. And it's like a little egret. Instead of being white, it is black. You check out the yellow feet, right? We're going to come back to these yellow feet. Now, the black egrets have the most remarkable fishing habit. That is, they walk along and then they suddenly throw their wings forward in this umbrella. And as far as I know, I don't know that it's been scientifically proven as to exactly what they're doing, but you can imagine very easily, you look carefully at this picture, and you've got an area of shadow underneath being thrown. So that black egret, I think they are either throwing a shadow, which allows them to, it cuts the glare, so they can see prey underneath the water, um, <clears throat> or equally, the shadow that is formed, it, it may encourage fish to come and search for shelter, because they will see it as a secure place, right? There's a shadow, there's got to be something covering the surface. And then they swim in underneath, and that's it. They get taken by that bill. Egrets, they eat fish and frogs. But there is another trick that both little egrets with the yellow feet and the black egrets with the yellow feet do. And that is they actually tremble their foot. They, they'll push a foot forward and they actually kind of shake it underneath the water. And it is, again, the suggestions are either it is disturbing little invertebrates or fish or whatever, chasing them out, or maybe the yellow feet even attracted. I always used to make the joke that uh, the reason these birds have got yellow feet is that when they strike them, the prey, they don't hit their own foot and, and, and get away with it. But now, look at this, look at this picture. I mean, yeah, they will often feed a community like this and walk along and then you get, they will all throw the umbrella at the same time. And I suppose it strengthens the, the reason that they do it individually. If you have a big area of shadow, all the fish go, whoa, there's shelter over there. And, and they all benefit from feeding together. It is the most remarkable, remarkable thing to see. Now, going to come back to this of why are so many water bird species so widely distributed in Africa? So if you look at the savanna species, for example, in, in Southern Africa versus East Africa, and certainly West Africa, there's a big difference in the species makeup between West Africa and Eastern and Southern Africa, but also lots of differences just between Southern and Eastern Africa. But uh, so many of the water bird species are widely distributed, this being one of them, the yellow-billed stork. Now, why is that? And we'll come, we'll come back to the answer for that in a moment. And here we look at these yellow-billed storks and how they feed. And by the way, you see how long the legs are in a yellow-billed stork and the bill it allows them to go deep into a pond or a river and they will hold their beaks open in the water. This particular bird was actually holding its wing open. And so I think it was kind of doing uh, something of an umbrella, if you like, like the black egret creating a shadow. Maybe it enabled it to see, but they are feeding by touch because if as soon as they touch a fish or something, the bill will snap shut and, and away it goes. Now, these are big birds. 
and, and to feed successfully, uh, and certainly in the breeding time, they are finding fish which are concentrated by dry down. So think of this, uh, we, live in, we live in Africa with its seasonal cycles, with wet years, with dry years, with wet seasons and dry seasons. So if we just look at an annual pattern, we're all familiar with the idea of, of some areas getting summer rain, the ponds fill up and then they dry down. Now in Africa, we have some huge wetlands. And so the thing is, for some of our species, when the habitat disappears, when, when the floodplains go dry, they have to fly, and they do fly sometimes hundreds of kilometers to find suitable wetlands. And so there is a much greater need for water bird species to be highly mobile over big distances. And this means basically for to be able to conserve many of our big water birds in particular, but not only big ones, we need a network of protected huge wetlands across Africa. So the thought is then if the Okavango runs dry here in, in northern southern Africa, it can affect the abundance of some species in East Africa and so on. Right, and he has, he has another touch feeder, and he has one which is actually doing quite well for, uh, for the reason of human interference uh, or habitat alteration. So the African spoonbill is also a touch feeder, and when you watch them feeding, so they walk through the water and you see them sliding their bill to and fro. <laughs> And apparently within the spoon of their bill, he has a good old spoon bill there, it's incredibly sensitive. And when something touches that, they will snap it up, throw their head back, and there, there you can see a little fish going in. And you can see they really get into it. Look at the other bird in, in front of that. Now, human beings have built dams all over the place. And so some water bird species have benefited hugely from this. And in Southern Africa, for example, spoonbills from being occurring only in the northeast of Southern Africa, basically, have now spread all the way down to Cape Town, <clears throat> utilizing farm dams, basically. Now, African fish eagle, also familiar with this. So let me try and uh, interest you with a couple of other things about it. They are able to catch fish weighing up to two kilograms and carry them. Now, now that's a, that's a, a, a decent sized fish. Um, when they get bigger, they've been known to be able to kind of drag, catch and drag fish to the end of the water. Basically, they, they sort of do a kind of a, a breaststroke action with their wings and they sort of thrash to the to the edge of the, the dam or, or lake or river or whatever to the side. Now, if you are ever lucky enough to see something like that happen, you have to know you're probably looking at a female again. Uh, when I say again, I just mean females were referring to the females in terms of the African jacana because the females are bigger and really approximately they can weigh almost half as much again as a male bird. It happens in a lot of raptors that the females are bigger and it is true, it is true for, um, <coughs> for fish eagles as well. And then a lot of fish eagles eat birds in the area in which I live I think their primary prey is actually red knobbed coots, and they're known to eat flamingos and all sorts of things. So yeah, fish eagles by name and fish eagles by diet very often, but they are also 
quite capable. Um, for some fish eagles, uh, fish is not necessarily their main item of diet. Right, so there you are. There is the special wetland habitat. And you think of it in terms of its availability. How much of, of the area is available to birds? If it's too deep, you can't get there if, if you're a walking, wading species. Uh, even a fish eagle can only go, it can fly out right across a dam, but it can't go underwater. So the feeding strategy of, of the reed cormorants and other cormorants, and I'm going to show you the data in a moment, and their different ways of going about things. Now, that is uh, the breeding plumage with the spots. These are called wing coverts on the spots on the tail. Another name was long-tailed cormorant, which really shows up here. So let's have a look at that bill. There's a slight hook on it. So it tells you it's probably catching something a bit slippery. Frogs and fish are the main item of diet. And of course, so they can swim underwater. And by the way, if you ever, if you're in a place where there's a lot of water birds, you might occasionally see a really, really interesting behavior. Uh, when you have a reed cormorant feeding along the shore, sometimes they will swim along a shore and feed. And suddenly you become aware that your birds are camacorps and little egrets following along the shoreline. Basically, they are using the reed cormorants as beaters. So as the fish flush out in front of the reed cormorant, they get a chance to nail something. Now, next picture, two things I want to show you. One about identification again. Now, there's a much bigger cormorant called the white-breasted cormorant. Just bringing home the understanding that a juvenile reed cormorant can be white all the way down. But you know, the bill is the same size. It's a much smaller bird than the white-breasted cormorant. But do not think automatically that cormorant is white underneath. It's got to be a white-breasted cormorant. And then you often see these cormorants sitting there with their wings open. And uh, of course, if you swim, <clears throat> So the cormorants have got this unique problem, okay? Birds are, are, are really quite buoyant and lightweight because they have to fly. But then to go underwater, the last thing you want to be is buoyant and lightweight. So the, the cormorants do absorb some water when they go um, <coughs> fishing. Not nearly as much, though, as the darters, which I'm going to tell you about in a moment. But you will often see them then sitting with spread wings. And almost certainly then this behavior to a large extent is, is about drying out after a, a fishing expedition. It has also been suggested that uh, by heating up more quickly, it helps to speed up metabolism. You know, the warmer the body, the, the more quickly your metabolism will work. Okay, now the remarkable bird that is the African darter, <clears throat> known as the snake bird, and there it is. <clears throat> but look at the profile of that darter. Now their feathers actually absorb water a lot more quickly than reed cormorants. But the wings remain essentially waterproof because if they have to fly, even if they have a waterlogged body, they need to have dry wings so they can escape. But there too, so often we see these darters and reed cormorants, white-breasted cormorants, standing there drying out. So they have the tactic then of, of being able to dive. It makes the whole water column, basically, unless it's an exceptionally deep lake, available to them. Of course, the clarity of the water is another issue. Right, so we move on now 
to blacksmith Lapwing. So first of all, why blacksmith? So let's just listen to that call. So we're going to go over in the background. So, in the old days, when um, the metal workers worked with metal in in fires and in their uh, in their little workshops, they would have an anvil, big metal anvil, and they would be tapping away. You know the blacksmiths, and that is call is supposed to recall the sounds that the blacksmiths would would make. Uh, when they're hammering away on the metal. So that's where that name comes from. Now, the plovers, here you have water edge birds. So they, they seldom go very deep, but obviously they can wade, as you can see from this picture here. This is a very widespread and common bird. But they are visual feeders. <clears throat> In a moment, I'm going to show you some other wading birds which feed by probing and essentially by uh, touch and smell. And these birds have got relatively short bills, big heads, right? And I think the big heads have got big eyes because if you're feeding by sight, you need good eyes up. So they are picking things off the surface, the, the blacksmith the plovers. And a juvenile bird. Now they breed <coughs> on on the flat ground. They lay their eggs normally in a place where they are pattern camouflage eggs, and they don't make much of a nest. Uh, so it just looks like uh, some more bits of gravel or, or something like that. Now they're incredibly vulnerable they're out there in the open. So how do you reduce the vulnerability? Well. While the eggs are there, there's nothing much that you can do. They have to wait until they hatch. But the chicks are precocial. What precocial means that within a very short time, within hours of hatching, they can run up and down. And, and so they can run away from danger. And quite often, you will come across a dam and you'll see these blacksmith lapwings being really quite agitated. Have a look, have a look up and down, look carefully. And you may find that in fact, what is happening is oh, there's a little blob running over there and you'll see a little chick, a highly camouflaged chick and the adults are running interference, right? They make a hang of a racket in front of a potential predator, including you, if you happen to be walking along next to the water, that's what you are, a potential predator. And they may come and make a hang of a racket. If, if they dive bomb you, you can be absolutely certain that they've got chicks or eggs nearby. And always juvenile birds present problems. So, but you see the pattern remains the same. A short bill, here yeah, this black, let me show you the upper bird, black except for the crown on the head, and it's mainly showing there on that juvenile bird. All right. So <clears throat> now we come on to smaller birds. These are now 20 centimeters long. And I'm going to do three of the commonest small waders that come to our shores from the Northern Hemisphere. One is called the common sandpiper, and I've written there, don't forget the bob, because they alone amongst the, that group of, of waders, they bob. And it's already a clue as to what the species is. Now, common sandpipers with, remember what I was telling you now about the big eye and the short peg shaped bill. Now we've got in the common sandpiper, 
The bill is already becoming a lot longer and more slender. The head is smaller because they don't need big eyes. And these birds feed by probing. Right? So they, that bill there, will be incredibly sensitive. They walk along and you'll see them picking away at things and probing into the mud. Now, just think about it. If, you, if they're sticking their bills in the mud, they can't see anything. So they must be responding to both touch and taste to find the little goblies that make up their food. Now, they're on the top right. It is so important. These birds are difficult to identify. And so, so sorry, let's go back there. When you are struggling there to identify these birds, you must be ready and waiting for that moment with your binoculars when those birds get up and fly. And because you're looking for things like, here, yeah, this white line down the middle of the wing and the white on the outer tail. So apart from the bobbing, the common sandpiper also has this habit of flap and glide, flap and glide. And so just seeing the bird go off like that, you know what it is. Other characters are this brown apron, this white coming up here. And look at this faint black and brown barring on the back. You have to be quite close to see that. Don't forget the bob. And here, I call this a benchmark wader because it is bigger, the common green shank, and quite common and widely distributed. So if you have a, a dam with wading birds on, you've nearly always got a common green shank, and it's the bigger, whiter one. Now look how long that bill is. And they are tactile. In other words, they're very sensitive to, to touch. And you can see a bill like that hat <clears throat> enables them to go that deep into the mud or water and mud. Um, and it, again, it's a way of making more habitat available to them. And here in flight, remember what I said about you've got to be ready. You've got to be ready to look. And now this species, for example, there's no white in the wing. The white runs up the back and essentially the rump and tail are white, show up clearly. Right, and uh, just a reminder, so another common and widespread little wader is the wood sandpiper, and spotted on the back um, with, with its yellow legs. Uh, very often, excuse me, <coughs> In, in quite next to vegetation, often associated with wetlands with a lot of vegetation, low vegetation on the edge. So those are three of the most widespread common small waders. Remember, these are all tactile feeders probing in, in the mud. It doesn't matter how dirty the water is, it doesn't matter to them because they're probing all the time. So here's another wader now, the uh, water thick knee. So for the first time, you know, I've actually had a look at the knees on these things. And I guess, you know, they are a bit thicker than, than the other waders, but still a bit puzzled by uh, how they ever came to be called thick knees. I don't think they're that spectacular. But one look at this bird, and what's the thing that strikes you straight off? Look how big that head is, and look how big the eye is, and therefore you understand that this bird is a nocturnal feeder. Big eyes together in the light, big, big heads because they've got big eyes that need to be contained within that head. So these are resident wading species, African species. And every now and again, somebody has the experience of watching the, the water dickops chasing off uh, in the same way that blacksmith plovers <clears throat> will create a hangover disturbance and a um, uh, distraction 
to, to scare away predators or potential predators from their nests. The, the thick knees, are, you can say they're quite aggressive, they're quite brave. They're prepared to, to stand their ground against much, much bigger animals to protect their youngster, and they will spread their wings. It's typical of what so many animals do, including human beings for that matter. When you get into conflict, you try and make yourself look much bigger than you really are. And, and this is how those water dukops, uh, so that's the old Afrikaans name for them, the water thickness are. All right, pied kingfishers. Now, one of the most common, common wetland birds. And you know what? Hey, it's got a couple of remarkable things about it. It is often cited as the largest bird in the world which can hover in still air. So next time you're out there looking at a pied kingfisher, which maybe depends where you are, you see them every time you go to the wetlands, or maybe not, just spare a moment there and go, the biggest bird that can hover in still air. So other birds, um, classic is the old black wing, black shouldered kite, uh, and, and even much bigger birds like jackal buzzard even can hold a stationary place in the air if there is an oncoming or an uplift of air. So the key thing here is the still air. This bird in the middle is in a display posture, which again you'll sometimes see, but check this out, right? And once again, I've got a couple of birds mating. And you can see the difference between male and female in the coloring. So you see the bar there, that is a male, which means this bird is a male. Now, here's an interesting thing that I found out about pied kingfishers, is they are cooperative breeders. Now, what is that? So a whole lot of birds, Now, I think there are probably more species that do this than I appreciate it at the moment, but um, there's a good number of bird species in which the breeding pair is assisted by other birds other than the mother and the father. Now, very often, these are young birds of the previous year or years. So they come and help out. So breeding can be hard yards. It can be tough. So call the family in to help which ensures that your genes are also more successful in the long run, in a family sense. But in the pied kingfishers then, they've actually found that they have helpers at the nest, but only the male birds. And of course, it'll be easy to work that out because males have got the black bar. And <clears throat> so the main helpers are the young males from the previous year, but they do also have unrelated birds assisting. Um, and in this case, they don't feed. Remember that these kingfishers breed down burrows. So if you're going to help out, basically the bird on the nest, uh, at that stage, the helpers will deliver the fish to, to, uh, to mommy and daddy. Um, I guess just thinking about it as I'm sitting here, as the youngsters get bigger, maybe their bills protrude from the nest and anyone can feed them. So cooperative breeding. And if you look really carefully then at bird species, and you, uh, you may actually pick up the sense of it. Bird ringing, of course, really helps to identify birds, but uh, sometimes birds have individual coloration. Right, now, to the crakes and rails, they are, uh, for the bird is amongst us, the crakes and rails are elusive, high-value birds, and this is the easy, easy peasy one of them all. This is the crake which shows itself most often, uh, hence I've called it the obvious crake. It's also a gorgeous little animal with its lime yellow bill and red feet and pure black plumage and I brought up 
a young bird here and uh, also now introducing and explaining a bit more the term jizz as standing for general impression shape and size the first letter of all of those if you look at those two birds you can see the obvious similarity from the stance and everything else between the two of them but you can see the coloration how different it is the bill colors <coughs> the body color and so on and um it is a skill which you need to develop as a birder of getting to appreciate for each species its shape. In other words, that well, shape, size, general impression, how they move, etc. It's gorgeous. Americans, uh, the term is mainly used in an American sense now, J I double Z. I like the old fashioned because you can see where it comes from. This possibly then the commonest water bird in Africa. And so we tend not to look at it too much. So they've got, um, uh, we want to come back to two things. Now, they also have precocial chicks. And they have these exposed nets, nests. But where do you breed? Right, on islands and things like that. But another way of getting around the issue and rise and fall of water is to build a floating nest. Also helps you to build really inaccessible nests uh, in, in swamps and so on. But the chicks need to come off there really quickly because a chick sitting on something like this is really vulnerable to, say, marsh harriers and things like that. And, and so a chick like this one I'm showing you has got to be, yeah, wow, you know, a day or two or three old, really, really tiny. And the old knobs, they become really obvious during the breeding season. The bull tells you that it is a strong, powerful bull. Uh, they are, in fact, vegetarian. Okay. And now a little greed, dab chick of old. Uh, some, some of my most favorite birds, an adult bird, and here another over there, and then a juvenile bird. And once again, just keep a watch. Um, what the guidebooks don't do is carry the whole range of juvenile plumages. So you are often going to see a bird in a plumage which is not shown to you in a book. And that's when you start to need to say, look at the behavior of the bird, look at the shape of it. That must be a little grief. Okay. The greater flamingo. Remarkable birds. I was sitting thinking this afternoon, I don't know any other birds other than flamingos that feed with their heads upside down. So they are filter feeders, actually. What they do is they will wave their heads or move their heads from side to side under the water and they're using their tongue to pump uh, water into their mouths and then out again. And they've got grooves on the inside of their mouth in which when the water is expelled, they will trap like little invertebrates, which is what the greater flamingo will feed on. Now, you know, I shared with you the idea of these birds traveling for hundreds of kilometers in different seasons and times to exploit their habitat. So their habitat is mobile. They have to be mobile. Now, the conditions being right for greater flamingos to breed are often <coughs> quite rare. And it may well be that most flamingos breed successfully, they, they are really quite long-lived. And so they might only breed. Remember, to replace yourself, you need to raise one youngster to breeding age. So they might breed over a 30 or 40 year lifespan, maybe only four times, because the mass breedings, certainly the case in Southern Africa, 
are occasional and rare, relatively rare. So the demographics of it are quite rare and quite bizarre then. And if you think of the vagaries which are coming with climate change, of the extremes that are going to come in, if things are only occasionally right in the best of times, how is it going to go for our flamingos in the worst of times? Right, so white pelicans. Another example to bring home this idea of how mobile the big water birds are. The white pelicans are cooperative feeders, or well, they can be. So in other words, they, they, they will feed as a group, and you can actually watch them, say, going through a pan, and sometimes they'll even all, uh, you know, fill up their beaks. So, so the big beaks, they will scoop underwater, and you get fish flapping around in the, in the gula pouch there. This is a picture from then <coughs> 46 years ago in, in the north of Lake St. Lucia, where the white pelicans uh, used to breed. I'm actually not sure if they breed at St. Lucia anymore. I presume they do from time to time. But at that stage, they were feeding into um, the Usutu um, wetlands, floodplains, uh, 100, 250 kilometers away. And then they would bring the food back to their youngsters. That idea of the space and volume that is required to keep our big water birds common. And here is, I call it a, a smaller, more agile penguin, a penguin, pelican. And there was the old breeding colony on the Tlitlui River at Lake St. Lucia. So the bigger peng pelican breeding on the ground, the white pelican, this one breeding in the trees. Pink back is quite hard to see. Like all these birds with, with the name white back, pink back, or whatever, it's normally only in flight sometimes that you get to see that character. It's grayish in color. Now, another is the last bird of the evening, and an utterly remarkable animal that I've only ever seen once in my life. And what a fabulous thing this is, the African skimmer. And skimmers, there are, I'm not sure how many species worldwide. There, there are at least two, maybe there are more. But they feed by dragging an extended lower bill. So the top bill stops there. But they drag their lower bill through the water. And when it touches a fish again, it will, they will snap their bill shut and grab, reach down and grab. And, I mean, how specialized is that? Now, this bird was the first extinction of a bird in southern Africa, South Africa, rather. And they bred at Lake St. Lucia. The last known breeding was in 1943. Uh, and... Uh, well, what has happened over the last 15 or 20 years is that with foreign aid, they have made a huge effort in reconstituting the original ecology of Lake St. Lucia, and there has been a considerable amount of success. This is a place called the Vincent Islands, halfway up Lake St. Lucia. And... In recent years, uh, or rather within the last year, three African skimmers have returned. the juveniles, they're young birds. But maybe they have returned and they will breed again. So often in our conservation lives and looking forward with the, with the dread of what is going to happen with climate change, etc., we need to take time out to, to really celebrate the successes that come from when things go right. And so maybe we can say 
the first extinction is on the, on the road to reversal. And I'm going to leave it right there. I'm, I'm going to go with that and say, that's where we headed, guys. Thank, Thank you. you, Aldo, very much indeed. That was once again a fantastic presentation, and I think um, we would have all enjoyed that. And I'm glad you ended on the African skimmer because it's actually my favourite bird, and I've been lucky enough to see that in huge flocks in Murchison Falls National Park on the Nile. Um, still the Victoria Nile before it goes in into Lake Albert there. And they are pretty incredible birds. So thank you. Um, the one thing I learned from this talk, which I'm sure there are others in the group, is how uh, behind I am in the new naming. Because I know birds, water birds, well, all birds change their names in the bird books. That's why they have to keep printing them. And there are a few birds that I did not even know, like the yellow-billed egret. I was still calling it the intermediate egret. Is that what was the intermediate egret? Or is that an East uh, African species? Yeah, so um, the, the old name was yellow-billed and then intermediate came in. And uh, I, I must confess, I've gone through these changes, Holly, and, and sometimes I, I automatically regress to to old patterns. So intermediate may now be the, the widespread African usage for that bird. Uh, yellow bill stalk, wood stalk, people may know it as, for example. So, okay, well, thank you, Aldi. Yeah. So, Sandra, before I come to you, I just want to hand over to Walter to give a big thank you on behalf of his group and his followers. And then I will come straight to you, Sandra, with your question. So, Walter, if you want to unmute and um, give a thank you on your behalf. Yes, Walter, go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm so grateful. Uh, right now, uh, it has been a pleasure learning more about bad, um, also the waterfalls or the water birds. I want to really appreciate uh, each and every person who managed to join the group. I hope it was uh, of more benefit to you. Uh, much, much appreciation to, uh, to Holly. Uh, Aldio, uh, the organizers of the of the meeting i'm so grateful thank you thank you, so thank you very much indeed so if you want to go ahead sandra i'll ask you to unmute with your question there okay we live on a farm outside st francis bay and about 20 years ago i we believe a fish eagle uh, a crow dropped a fish eagle in our dam and i reared her and she took on a mate and they built an eyrie in a, in a gum tree at the back of our farm. And they bred, they built an eyrie and they bred successfully for a number of years. And about six months ago, she just completely disappeared and, and her mate and never to be seen again. And I just wondered how old uh, fish eagles live to, if somebody could answer that question. Thank you. Um, I'm not. If anybody has got a specific answer to that, put your put your hand up. Otherwise, I will have a go at it. Let's let's see if anything comes up. All right. So the big eagles, and I imagine that the fish eagles will sometimes, in a favourable place, like it sounds, your farm was they would be able to slot into a pretty stable and secure life uh, <laughs> lifestyle. And uh, I would imagine under conditions like that, um, lifespan of several decades, maybe to two or three decades, is, is perhaps not unusual for large eagles. The basic rule is the bigger the bird, the longer it lives, and the more difficult it is to breed. So in other words, the older they are when they breed for the first time and so on. 
So, uh, so that's all pretty vague, Sandra, about saying, I don't really know the answer, but I'm pretty sure they live for decades at times. Okay, an interesting thing is, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yes. All right, an interesting thing is she totally, she particularly, she was huge, and she totally decimated our guinea fowl. So whilst we have fish on our dam, she would sit in a tree next to the dam, and the guinea fowl would come with this cacophony of noise and slowly come up the tree, and she'd say, all right, I have you, I'll have you. She totally decimated the guinea fowl population which has now replenished after she's gone. And I think she ate mainly guinea fowl, more than fish. I would see them catch fish occasionally, but she, but she specifically, the female, who was very much larger, she actually lived mainly on guinea fowl. Thank you. Yeah, well that's, I mean, that's really, really quite remarkable. And it does point to, if you read the books, um, and you see the sort of lists of prey items that are often recorded for different species, incredibly long list. But uh, I think what's remarkable about this is, uh, is what one bird or, or it sounds like just the female then specializing on one prey item. Hey, it worked for her. And, uh, I'm amazed, actually, because guinea fowl are pretty, pretty smart and uh, pretty together. I'm birds, not. So. I'm not sure about that. Um, <laughs> but another, another thing is, I did speak to Greg Darling. I don't know if you know him, and uh, he felt that she probably died. But why did her mate go? They just both completely disappeared. One yeah. day. I mean, you can speculate any any number of, of scenarios, including, you know, the, the nastiest of them being um, mm. uh, being victims of poison or, or, or poaching or in some form. Well, we have wind farms uh, near us too. We have a new, yeah. new wind farms near, so that worried me. Yeah, so I can see a wind farm taking out one bird. Um, taking out two birds both. would be, yeah. Um, so would he so automatically he, leave once she had gone? If she had died, would he automatically have sought another mate? I, I believe that in, in situations like this, that, that the rule would be if you've got a good territory with good food, breeding sites, etc., it's much better to hang around and wait for another bird to arrive and... and uh, um, with something like fish eagles, it might take them a year or two to reform a pair bond. But, um, you know, birds... The air is still there. Are, uh, uh, say again? The air is still there. Yeah. I, I would have expected him to hang around, basically, and, and hope... Mm. Uh, and, and wait for someone else to appear. So I want to ask you this question. Uh, you knew your birds well. Could you just look at them and go, there's the male, there's the female? Oh, yes. She was very big. She was much bigger yeah. than him. Much, much bigger. Yeah. She was huge. Yeah. And she was quite well known. I don't know whether she was bigger because she was hand-reared, um, but she went happily back into the wild um, and she took on this mate, and it was really a, a absolutely fantastic scenario watching them breed and having young, and then boom, she yeah. was gone. They were both gone. I mean, your, your story is quite remarkable about a captive bird going back and being that successful for that long. But um, in terms of its size, it wouldn't be a function of the fact that it had been hand reared. It's it's its final size is going to be genetically determined Genetic. in a range of sizes. And, mm. and the females in, in many raptors are bigger. And that is certainly the case for, for fish eagles as well, that they can be, um, females can be 50% heavier than the males. Mm. And she people was speculate big. why, yeah, speculate why it is, you know, an obvious one which pops into the mind is, 
Um, the female has to lay eggs, therefore a bigger body size allows, uh, makes that task e easier. If she has a bigger role in, um, um, and I don't know this personally, in brooding the birds, uh, the, the eggs, then maybe uh, her bigger body and bigger body reserves allows her to fill that role better. Another suggestion for these raptors is, is the small agile male and, um, you, you know, the bigger, not so agile female, but allows them to, to focus on different Compatible ranges ability. of prey. Yeah. So you mentioned how the female would eat the guinea fowl. And do you know what the male ate? Well, he often he often caught fish. I never saw him eat a guinea fowl, funnily enough. But she regularly would eat guinea fowl. And the guinea fowl just kept coming back to the bottom of the tree <laughs> and climbing up the tree and being eaten. And then all the others would make this great big noise because their friend was being eaten. But now we have these mass, masses of guinea fowl since she's gone. Anyway, thank you very much for your answer. Well, yeah. Sandra, yeah. I think we'll all be wanting to hear if your fish eagle does come back. So please email, uh, share screen with some photos and we will send it round to everyone so that they know, because I think well, you also asked one, about that. Yeah, two were seen talks. flying over the farm on Sunday. So uh, that was quite exciting. So we're just hoping. I'm certainly, I've heard them calling again for the first time in six months. So fingers crossed. Yes, there thank you. you. Okay, well, let us know. Okay, so we've got yes. some questions in the chat here, Aldo. The first one, which I'm going to kind of link, is are there different morphs of the little egret and how do you distinguish it from the black heron? Okay, as far as I know, little egrets only come in white. Uh, and it's as, as easy as that. So little egret's white, black egret is black. And uh, so they both got yellow feet. Um, I think the sizes and bill shapes and everything is, is otherwise quite similar. Uh, but of course, such a radical difference in overall body color makes it easy to sort the two. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, Ayug, you've asked what kind of birds do fish eagles eat? And that was sort of red-billed coot. We've got red-knobbed coot, flamingos. What other birds were there, Aldo, that you had mentioned? Um, well, they're known to eat waterfowl. So so they would, they, there's a good array available. A good old Egyptian goose is probably a really fine target. Um but they were probably then attacking the, um, be taking the most common ones, yellow billed ducks, red billed teal, and so on. Um, and I think they have been even recorded as taking carrion. So a lot of eagles and a lot of raptors are opportunistic in the sense that if the right kind of prey type or size, happens to pitch within their hunting strategy, they will nail it and eat it. Um, and I think that sounds very much like um, like the rest. I, I'd be able to look up, I'm pretty sure you'd find that uh, fish eagles will also do things like eat uh, water monitors, uh, the lizards. And um, uh, I imagine they would eat any largish water bird, they could get their, their beaks on, uh, their claws on, things like uh, swamp hens and, and the like. And definitely, I know there's a couple of people here in the audience who have seen um, fish eagles take a heron. So I hope, Emmanuel, that answers your question. Do you want to add anything else onto that? I've just asked you to unmute if you are there. Okay, well, we will move on to the next question. Are cormorants related to darters in their DNA or in evolution? All right, so the they are different families. 
Um, and uh, if you just have one look at the neck and the bill, you can see uh, that difference. I'm not sure how closely related they are. They certainly, I mean, cormorants and darters are going to be much closer to each other than I think, say, to ducks or anything like that. But uh, I can't give you a really definitive, I can't give you a, a, a definite answer as to how closely. I would expect them to be quite closely related. Okay. Emmanuel's also come with a question, which I'll answer quickly, why the data is called the snake bird. Emmanuel, there's that long head that's above the water. Its body's sitting just below the water. It looks like a swimming snake. Yeah. Um, there is a question in regards to Egyptian geese. So why would an Egyptian goose go to a hammercock's nest to breed inside it? Does this mean that Egyptian geese just don't make nests? Um, I think, so my understanding of what Egyptian geese mainly do is they breed on top of the nest. Um, but Egyptian geese <clears throat> are, are, will feed, will feed, will breed on ledges and, and in small enclosed spaces. Um, and so little caves and so on. So I think what a hummercorp nest constitutes is just another version of that type of a nest site. They will sometimes breed on the ground on islands and in places like that. So I think <clears throat> in the nature of successful species that they're quite adaptable in, in their choice of nesting site. And as long as it ticks some of the boxes, um, you know, they're capable of putting together their own nest like other, other ducks and geese. So what they would, would use then in the case of being on top of a... Um, Hummercorp nest is is they would still put in uh, the the nest lining and so on, and if they actually go inside, which which I don't know about, uh, they've got even less work to do. But they're still going to be putting in there in in the interior of that nest. They will be putting lining materials and all that sort of thing. And if uh, I think it points to the adaptability of of the species. <clears throat> and I think adding on to that adaptability, you did say it's the most widespread. I think, well, I don't think, I know it is also in Moscow and across St. Petersburg in Russia. So it has made it all the way up to these areas. Um, so this really is a bird that gets everywhere and tells us all about it because they really are very noisy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and... Another question, do we have the white cormorant or is the white cormorant the same as the long-tailed cormorant? Now, I think there's a little bit of mixing up in names there, Walter. So I'm going to let Aldo just sort of go through the cormorants again and then just give us the highlights of each individual species. Okay, so there, there are two common freshwater cormorants and the daughter in Africa. So the big one, is the white-breasted cormorant, which in the adult is white from uh, you know, down the front to the top of the chest, and a juvenile bird is white all the way down. It is about twice the size and weight of the reed or long-tailed cormorant. Long-tailed cormorant then in the adult is dark, but the juvenile is, is white below. So, the data then is, is the third uh, member of, of this group of three. And it's got that really long snake-like neck and, and, a, and a pointy spear bill because they really do spearfish. They, they actually will uh, run their bill right through a fish to catch it. Um, and yeah, altogether much longer and more slender in, in, in all its proportions, the African data is, yeah. Thank you. And 
for anyone who is not a part of Walter's Wildlife Discussions, it's a phenomenal group for young students from across Africa learning about flora, fauna, biodiversity, and climate change. Do click the link in the WhatsApp group and you will be learning a lot. Aldo, I just want to add on about cormorants. For those of you who don't know the incredible fishing method of some rural um, fishermen in China, they actually work with the cormorant. So a lot of the fishing families will raise a cormorant themselves. The children will raise the cormorant and then they will fish with this cormorant. And what they do is they put an elastic band around its neck that's not too tight, not too loose. So the cormorant will go and catch a fish, but it will not be able to swallow the fish. And it will bring that fish back to the boat and the fisherman will put it in its boat and the cormorant will go out again and bring a fish back. And then every fifth or sixth fish, they remove the elastic band and the cormorant swallows the fish. And this is a, a relationship that's grown up over hundreds of years. And it's you, it's fading out now. And of course, with water qualities and hunting, and certainly I was in Madagascar and, and cormorants are on the on the food menu. Everybody's hunting cormorants. And you can't imagine there's much meat on there. But um, all of these different fishing relationships have grown up. I think they only exist in China, as far as I know, Aldo. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's... I'm also just look scratching really deep in, in the in the gray cells here. It may be across into the sort of Korea, uh, northern Japan kind of places as well, where people fished a lot and yeah. Pretty amazing. Mike, we have a question about the lifespan of a greater flamingo. So let's just pretend your sound dropped out at that moment. <laughs> 20 to 30 years. So I hope you're going to pass that one in your your guiding exam. Um, and I think, oh, the estimated lifespan of the African white pelican. Now, Patrick, we're going to unmute you. Marette, if you can find Patrick, because we're going to ask Patrick. Is it the African white parrot pelican, the great white pelican, or is it the pink-backed pelican? Because remember, if you're learning to guide, you've got to get these names. <laughs> Patrick? Yellow pelican. We missed it. Which pelican? Yellow, Yellow pelican. Yellow, yellow, the yellow pelican. pelican. We don't seem to get. We don't seem to get the yellow pelican. Okay, I imagine, Holly, um, the the great white pelican, um, African white pelican, at times um, becomes quite yellowish, and I I don't know if it's just oil of the oil gland, and it comes from preening, as happens with some other birds. But they can have a yellowish hue across them uh, at at times. So that'll be the white pelican. The pinkback pelican is is a grey pelican always. And again, um, if I was to try and answer the question of how long do they live, and I think the answer is going to be decades. And I don't know. Um, it is it's one of the questions which really fascinates people how long do do things live and uh, and the answer is too that it may be different in different areas uh, and there's also going to be a range some there's going to be some wise old pelicans and there's going to be who who live many years and then there's going to be some uh, not so smart pelicans that don't get very far in their lifespans as well so my answer would be decades again. And, and I think adding on to that, Aldo, and we've spoken of the threats, collisions is one of the biggest threats for pelicans. Um, collisions on pylons, the, the huge um, voltage wires on pylons. And yeah, that's that's one of their causes of death. And, and just one other story. We had a vet in Nakuru called Hugh Cran, and I remember him telling us as a child of a French documentary film group that came out to Kenya to film, and he was the vet on set. 
But the French didn't want to film with our African pelicans. They wanted to bring their own pelicans from France. So these pelicans were all flown out in their crates. And Hugh said that these pelicans were so well trained and they only spoke French. And every morning they had to do a health check and it depended which pelican was going to be in the film that day. And when I say in the film, they were flying with a micro light and filming the pelicans alongside. And they would call the pelicans, you know, Jean Roque, and the pelican would walk from the back of the thing and come. And the pelicans all wanted their tongues tickled. So they'd open their mouth and the French guy would tickle his tongue and the pelican would go out the gate and he would call the next pelican. So they all knew their name and they knew when they were wanted on set because if they were not wanted on set, they didn't get called and then they would just kind of sit there. And I remember Hugh telling us this story and as kids, we just loved it. Yeah, remarkable. <laughs> so I guess... If you're going to invest that much time in training a pelican, he better live for a while. So I think that brings us to the end. We're at uh, 25 minutes past nine. It's been a long session. Thank you, everyone who came. And Aldo, if you want to finish off and say anything more, otherwise we will say farewell to everyone. Well, I, I would like to say thank you, Walter, for the opportunity to talk to to all your all your folks, it's been great, and I, I see a, a number of a number of people who who uh, have joined my courses before. So hello to all of you, and thank you for coming in. And uh, Holly, thank you to Share Screen Africa. So a good night to you all. Hello. And uh, yeah, here's here's one for the African wetlands. <laughs> uh, 